Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Lindsay Harrell. I'm the president of the Hilton Head Island Concord Elegance and Motoring Festival. And I wanna welcome you to our third Tuesday Toast to Women Driving America. Um, and a big thank you to our guest host today, Jennifer Maher, who's here with us from Tech Force Foundation. Um, so Jennifer is here with us today. Um, and interestingly enough, Jennifer and I actually met for the first time on a Zoom call last week prepping for this. Um, if you wanna find the silver lining in COVID, it is this, or for me at least, it is this. Um, it's given me more time to connect with people outside of the Hilton Head Island Concord organization. Um, I have heard Jennifer's name over and over again over the last couple of years and have been told on more than one occasion that I need to meet her. Um, and if we were in a normal year where we were busy planning and getting ready for our event, we would um, probably not have the time to connect. So if I look at the positive in 2020, it's been um, making some new friends in a really strange year. Um, and I've gotta be honest, um, Tech Force Foundation, which Jennifer will tell you a lot more about um, as she gets going here in just a minute, is a really interesting organization, um, both professionally for me, as you know, I work in this industry, I see a need um, for younger people to get involved and to build our workforce, but also personally as a mom of a three and a half year old little boy who clearly loves working with his hands and clearly loves cars already, um, I see this as a pathway for him in his future. I think we're also laser focused and, and sort of programmed to think about college as the next step beyond high school. Um, it's nice to have a, a program and a foundation in place that helps drive kids that are, are not necessarily inclined in that direction. And I definitely see my son as being one of those in the future. So um, Tech Force could be something where he, he finds a good home. But I want to welcome Jennifer today. And of course, questions, we will get to questions at the end of this. Um, so feel free to either unmute and ask questions um, at the end when we're at that point, or feel free to put your questions in the chat and we'll get to those as well. But um, I want to turn it over now to Jennifer Maher from Tech Force Foundation. Jennifer, welcome. Awesome. Well, hello. And it's great to see so many good friends on the, on the Zoom chat. So thank you for being here for those of you who know me and for those of you who don't. Uh, hopefully I can you know, provide some good insight into Tech Force Foundation or you know, words of wisdom for the road ahead. Um, so I just would like to maybe start and give you guys a little bit of a quick overview of who is Tech Force Foundation and who am I and why should you care? And the bottom line is I joined Tech Force Foundation back in 2014. And it was a nonprofit that was started back in 07. And so it had been around for a while, but really focused on giving scholarships and grants to kids to be able to go off to technical school and become automotive or diesel technicians. And being a scholarship organization, of course, you know, a lot of students love you because everybody, who, who doesn't want a, a scholarship to go off to post-secondary? But what was really nice about it is it was focused only on that technician uh, career path. And so the students that were able to come in and apply didn't have to compete with all the other students going to four-year universities, et cetera. And a lot of times these students were coming up through schools where school didn't really fit them. And so they didn't always have the 4.0 and they used to think, you know, well, who's going to, how am I going to get help to go on to post-secondary? So having an organization like Tech Force being able to help support them in their dreams and knowing that when they could find kind of their niche and their, uh, their interests, they would thrive. So we went, we've been around for since 2007 doing scholarships and grants. But when I came on, the board of directors said, okay, we've been doing that really well, but we're a little bored. There's a lot more to be doing in this world than just giving away money because students love you for about a minute and then they forget who you are and what more can we be doing to make a difference in the world? And this is when we were listening, listening to the industry. And you've been hearing it for years and years and years about the, the tech shortage. And it's really a skilled labor shortage in America. And if you know Mike Rowe or other folks that talk about the skilled worker and the skilled, uh, the skills gap, we've done a pretty good job in this country over the last 30 years of killing the technical trades and telling everybody that there's only one road to success and that's through a four year university. And, you know, that's true for many, many people to be able to go on to a college or a university, but it's not for everyone. And we've left a lot of people behind in the education system saying, sit still, don't touch, 
listen to the lecture, watch the board. And yet there's a lot of tactile hands-on learners and they are brilliant in that tactile intelligence of being able to take things apart and put it back together and problem solve and be inquisitive. And, you know, they need to get up and, um, and move and touch things to learn. And this is where they thrive. And so, you know, they struggled a lot of times have struggled through the education system. And then they're thinking, oh my God, four more years of that, that's not me. And so when you start to really listen to, you know, the fact that you've got this trade, uh, the skills gap, and yet we've been telling everybody, and Mike Rowe will show you the poster that was hanging for the last 20 years in high school counselors offices that showed on one side, you know, here's the grease monkey, and it literally was an auto mechanic, you know, looking dirty and grimy and grungy, and then to the other side, or do you want to be this, and it was the cap and gown college graduate. And so again, just kind of setting this whole method that there was only one road to success was a disservice to so many for their own career paths and success, but also to us as a society, because we created our own problem that suddenly, you know, you couldn't find the workers that you needed. The other thing that kind of happened over 30 years is the world transitioned. And what used to be a blue collar career became a new collar career. And, you know, if you have ever looked under the hood recently, you know, the average car has 70 computers and 100 million lines of code. Grease monkey be gone. So the reality is, is these are computers on wheels. And for all of these young people who love STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, even the arts, you think about the design that goes into cars, you think about all of that science and technology, you think about the diagnostic equipment, and these are really new collar careers. And as we also know, because we've kind of shot skilled trades, you know what it costs to hire a plumber or an electrician these days or an auto mechanic or a diesel. So, you know, in the end of the day, they're laughing. They're laughing all the way to the bank saying, you know, I'm been able to, you know, we've got plenty of techs now making six figures or even starting off in the fifties. Uh, so, you know, it is, if you are good and you work hard, just like almost every other career, you can do very, very well. So that uh, that's what we're looking at now is we started listening to society and saying, okay, everybody's griping about the tech shortage, but who's really doing anything about it? And that's when you we looked at the past and lots of different OEs and others had started initiatives to try and solve the tech shortage, but it had failed. And we said, why did it fail? And it's like, well, because they were for profits. And so this is just my theory. My theory was that it was not for profits trying to solve a technician workforce shortage, which in the end of the day was for their bottom line and for their interests and you get it. But it takes sometimes a not for profit to be that hub in the connector. And we don't have a dog in the fight. We don't care where the kid goes to school. We don't care who they get employed by just as long as they get an education and a career that fits them and that they find their path. And even if we welcome kids into our community and we show them that this is a viable new collar career path and they decide to do something different, that's okay too. You know, but at least as a not-for-profit, we helped them explore their career paths, explore different types of education, told them that there's more than one road to success and that they really need to find what works for them, that we're all wired differently and then to connect them with all the resources. If you want to solve the technician shortage, our theory was the solutions are already out there. There's companies and associations and nonprofits and after school programs and tech schools all across America, but you don't know what you don't know. And I can tell you right now, I, until I came into this job, I didn't know there were tech schools in my own community. I didn't know about the East Valley Institute of Technology or EVIT or Westmec or any of these schools. I didn't know because it wasn't in my universe. And if I'm not tinkering with my kid in the garage around a car or something, or I'm not taking them to NASCAR races or I'm not into it, then how are they expect to be ex have that experience or that exposure? So there's all these really great resources out there, but who knows? So we looked at it and said a not-for-profit is the one who can collaborate and to bring all those resources together and package them in a way that kids and parents can find them and to start to access them. 
and that we can get those charitable donations for those high school auto shops. We can get the donations of experiences to take kids to NASCAR races or to a Barrett Jackson auction and to give them that exposure. We as a not-for-profit can get volunteers and companies, their corporate employees to be able to volunteer their time to be a mentor in a kid's life or to even just take a group of 20 kids out to a car show or a race. So this is where a not-for-profit really can be the difference in being the strategic, um, you know, and spe strategically spearheading an initiative to solve a societal problem. So that's what Tech Force has evolved into. And we've got a board of uh, 15 amazing people from Nissan to Tesla to Advanced Auto Parts, um, lots of different organizations, including even the Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation because about 25% of all of our scholarships and grants still go to veterans who are looking to transition their careers from being deployed overseas to coming here at home. And yet the joke of the matter is, is you know, when they're overseas and deployed, they can work on billions of dollars worth of equipment. But when, we come, when they come home, they're not allowed to work on your Kia until they've gone back and gotten all these renewed certifications. So, you know, they're one of the most popular hires. Everybody wants them because of their discipline and work ethics, et cetera. But even they need help transitioning into the workforce. So that's what kind of I'm doing these days is I call myself a mama bear is because I just look at these, I call them kids because I'm over 50, but quite frankly, again, these veterans, they're not kids. But, you know, I look at these students and the people who have to go back, want to go to a school to get the training to get the education and experience so they can work on these computers on wheels and to keep America rolling. And we don't just look at automobiles, but we look at everything in the transportation industry. Automobiles, diesel, the trucks, the engines, motorcycles, um, you know, aviation. We kind of say when techs rock, America rolls. And so especially during COVID-19, we did a special thanks to tax commercial uh, because again, in the early days, it's like, well, who's getting all the grocery store shelves full? Yes, it is the uh, truck drivers, but it's also the technicians who are keeping all of those fleets moving and uh, who's getting the equipment where it needs to go. So, you know, we always say you have to think a tech. If your car started today, think a tech. If you got to work, think a tech. If your groceries are on the, on the shelf, thank a tech. So that's kind of what Tech Force is all about. And as I say, I'm Mama Bear. I got passionate about this because I've spent 30 years in my nonprofit career. And so at heart, I'd like to think I'm mostly a nonprofit person, which means I am very passionate about using my skills and my business acumen to make a difference and do good in the world. So I love that I'm a marketer and I love to negotiate strategic alliances and bring corporations into the fold and help put their money and their employees and their resources into making a difference. That's a win-win um, mutual uh, benefit. But at the same time, if I'm not moving the needle on something that matters in the world, then I would have an empty soul. And so for me, it's about championing these young people and letting them, giving them the tools and the resources to explore a career path to connect the dots in order to be successful. And I've looked at my own kids raising my own kids and my uh, boy was, has ADHD and dyslexia and I watched the schools beat him up, sit still, don't move, you know, and that's not how he learns. And so I recognized that and said, there's a lot of these students out there that need champions. And I think we, again, kind of as a country, we tell kids they can do and be anything they want in the world, good luck. And we kind of just throw them out there. And it's great to know that you can do anything you want in the world, but it's really challenging when you just, you don't know what you don't know and you don't know how to navigate it. So some of the things that Tech Force is doing to solve this, and number one is we will roll out in the new year, uh, 2021, something called the Tech Force Community. And this has been a project in the works for two years, um, a lot of money and a lot of time and sweat. But the belief was you need to create an online portal, a place digitally where students can go because this is how they learn. This is how they talk. This is how they research. They look for all the answers on the web. 
and they can build communities. And so if they can go to one community where all of these future and working techs can rock and to strut their stuff and to show their prowess and to show their education and their certifications and their history. And here are the projects I'm working on in my garage right now and have this whole community being able to earn credits for to be able to acquire tools or to be able to apply for your scholarships, to be able to find all of these resources that are out there in a one-stop shop that's gamified and, and built the way they want to interact, we think that'll be incredibly successful. So imagine LinkedIn meets match.com and this environment where all of these uh, future and working technicians can really um, start to show who they are, show their prowess and connect to say, oh, I need certifications. Where do I get those? Oh, I never heard of ASE. Okay, got it. Oh, I want to go to a conference. I didn't know that these things existed. And they can go through the pipeline. So imagine they're young, they're in middle school or high school, and they're just even finding the after school programs in their community that have auto you know, tech or an automotive overlay that they get to expose to. And where there's free tickets where now they can sign up to say, hey, I wanna to go to a NASCAR race. And suddenly our volunteers who work for advanced auto parts or AutoZone say, yeah, I'll take 10 kids to a NASCAR race, happy to do that. And then they start getting older and older all the way to the fact that now they're going to tech school and getting scholarships. And now they're going ahead and they're looking for jobs and we're able to find them the jobs in the locations that really fit who they are and what they're trying to do. That's a tech force community because what gets measured gets done. And it's one thing to go out and just be preaching that this is a great career path or you know, you have, have a wonderful success, but how do we know we're moving the needle if we can't measure it? The other thing you heard from employers all the time is like, but I need techs but the pipeline is too dry. So if we know from the research that TechForce has done that our country needs 125,000 new entrants a year just to keep up demand, that's 125,000 new entrants. So new people coming into the career path, not even replacing the retirees, but just new entrants to keep up with the demand. But our post-secondary, our community colleges and our tech schools are only graduating 57,000. So that's the, there's the gap. And that's why I call it the running of the bulls. For every employer and every recruiter who's fine, trying to hire one tech, and by, certainly you've got, you know, Penske Automotive and Auto Nation and all of these trying to hire thousands of techs. They're running after them like the bulls going, throwing money and resources and tuition reimbursement and tool allowances, trying to get this scarce resource. So if you don't back up and start to find a way to start filling more of the pipeline and having more young people start to think about this as a career path, then there's always going to be that shortage and that, that lack. And so it's not enough to just tell kids it's a great career. You have to help them through the pipeline. The other thing I, so I think is fascinating is I learned at TechForce because we give these scholarships, but we also give grants and we set up Life Happens Emergency Grants because I kept looking again, if you're going to solve the problem, then one of the worst and worst things to see and witness is when a kid is actually in school studying to become a technician and to enter the automotive career path. And yet they're applying to TechForce because of a $450 hiccup pothole that's going to derail them from staying in school. And the number one life happens emergency grant request we get, ready? The irony is so thick, car repair or flat tires. So here you have this student trying to go to tech school, living paycheck to paycheck off a part-time job, you know, burning it at both ends of the candle. And suddenly they come out of class, by the way, these schools, the way they measure everything is it's not even your grade that matters about you getting your job. It's your attendance record. Ye who has a hundred percent attendance record is much more likely to immediately get hired and command the salary they want than the better grade and a, a, and a less good attendance record. Why? Because empty bays don't make people money. 
right? So this whole idea that you have to have 100%, as close to 100% attendance. Well, you walk out, you, we all remember what it'd be a, a starving student. You walk out to the parking lot and you've got a flat tire or your car won't start. And you've not learned enough yet to fix your own car. So now literally the wheels fall off. You find out that you've got three bald tires, they need to be replaced, or you know, you've got to come up with 400 bucks to get your car fixed, or, and suddenly that's the difference between paying your rent or getting your car fixed and getting to school. And so you choose to get your car fixed to get to school, and now you can't be paid for the rent and the, and, you know, the dominoes fall. So I find the irony just pathetically thick that here we are needing these technicians in our workforce and yet it's a the average $450 pothole derails a kid and forces them to drop out so that's when we turned it around and said again we're going to employers you've got to be part of the solution you can't just be at the end of the funnel trying to throw tool allowances and tuition reimbursement to the kid you have to help. This is a cause. This is a cause that matters. It matters to your bottom line, but it also matters that if you care about a boys and girls club and you care about kids and, tech and education of any kind, then why shouldn't you care about technical education? And why shouldn't you care about helping kids do career exploration and to be successful? And so this is a cause that matters to our bottom line. It matters to us as consumers and to have safe. I want to get my kids to school safely. I want qualified technicians and, uh, you know, but if we want that, then you have to start to be a, a part of the solution and help to fund something like tech force that can back up and get more middle school and high school students exposed and excited and open to this career path, connect those dots. And then when they are studying to become that future workforce, don't let a $450 hiccup derail them. So that's kind of, I guess, one of the things we're doing in this tech force community. It's what we're doing with our scholarships and grants. So it's not just tuition, but it's helping all along the pathway. And then we're also still storytelling. So again, there's too many old stigmas out there that still persist. And it's whether it's the shade tree mechanic or the grease monkey. We did a lot of focus groups with young people and what was fascinating, because again, a good marketer says, who's our target audience? You know, what are we going to try and do and who are we talking to? So you might assume you're just talking to young people and trying to inspire them about this career path. Nope. You start doing focus groups and the young people say, hey, you can get me excited about cars and motorcycles and boats and engines and planes. I get it. This is the future. Right. It may not look like it did in the past. It may be more advances of mobility and it may be all different ways of, of transport in the future, but they're not going away. So you can get me excited and I understand these are computers on wheels, but get my parents out of my way. Because the minute they go home in middle school and they say, you know, we're doing this career exploration thing in my middle school class because it's mandated by the state to have kids in seventh grade start to do career exploration. So the kids start doing it and then they come home and they're like, well, you know, I kind of like cars and I like fixing things. And what's mom do or dad? What do you want to do that for? And I don't know about you, but the minute my parents gave me that look, I pivoted and tried to find something that got a much better response of admiration. And I think that's just natural. But by doing that, we've now suddenly cut ourselves off right there in the beginning because the parents don't know what they don't know. They only remember what it used to be. So we have to do a lot more storytelling to bring up um, the, you know, the, the awareness that uh, these are really very viable and um, good jobs. The other thing we are doing in that storytelling is if you want to fix the technician shortage, in the skilled labor shortage in America, then maybe you better start talking to 52% of the population. And that's women. And so we know that less than 2% of all technicians in this country are women. Well, you've got a shortage. And guess what? Women are awesome technicians. And so we make a very proactive stance on setting up with our Women Techs Rock initiative. 
and showing imagery and videos and interviews and testimonials with women techs who rock and women who are in the industry. And I see a Lynn St. James out there on this Zoom call. And, you know, I mean, these women who are breaking barriers every day and whether it's, you know, audacious barriers or it's just putting up with some of the crap that they get in the shop and not letting it derail them and helping them to understand the expectations. And we have so many amazing videos of women being able to say, you know what? Yeah, I have to put up with some crap sometimes, but you know what? It makes me stronger. It makes me better. I work to be the best. And you know, they're very proud. And this is where you wanna show those stories so that other young women see themselves in this path and see, you know, this is, they could do this too. But it, if you don't see any imagery and you don't hear any stories, then you just buy into it that it's not for you. And we don't think that's right. So we have an initiative with Untech Force called Women Techs Rock, and it's uh, specifically focused on connecting those dots for young people so that they can see the stories, they can hear the testimonials. And we're doing more and more to make sure that, you know, we can really uh, set some expectations and help them know what to expect going forward. So that's kind of, yes, in a nutshell. And uh, of who tech force is and maybe again why i'm passionate is as a not-for-profit professional i've worked for make-a-wish i've worked for ymca of the usa the nature conservancy and i've consulted with many many of the blue chips around the country and it's always really been around my my expertise probably is, is in corporate relations and strategic alliances and marketing so not as so much all around the individual donor um, but being able to sit down and negotiate with corporate America and say there's a win-win here, that to me was always has been thrilling because I do think that uh, over the last 30 years, companies have understood that you just can't hand out money to be nice, right? That's altruistic, but it doesn't really help you stand up to your shareholders and say, why have you spent millions of dollars with charity? But instead, when you get strategic, and you start to say, okay, Disney is all about dreams and wishes. And so wishes make a wish. There is a strategic alliance. And one of the biggest wishes ever, the most requested wish is to go to Disney. So that's a strategic partnership. Same thing with a Home Depot's or a Lowe's and a Habitat for Humanity. If you and your employees and your business is all about building, and home building and projects and DIY, why the heck shouldn't you be walking that talk and having your footprint and your leave behind be with a charity that's doing that same type of work? So over here, I argue with TechForce that when I came into this business, everybody was complaining about the technician shortage. But when I would go in, they'd say, oh, well, we, we give to the Boys and Girls Club. You know, we give to Make-A-Wish. We raise money for this, you know, cancer. And I'd say, you know, I get it because when I was at Make-A-Wish, I would have put my Make-A-Wish hat on and I would have negotiated with you about why that made sense. Oh yeah, all your customers are women and da, 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 and you want to show them you care about breast cancer. And yeah, I get it. Been there, done that. But I'm on this side of the house right now and I was looking around going, who's donating to this cause that's affecting the bottom line of their own industry? And so I now really look at it and say, you know what, this, the technician shortage, a workforce shortage is the cancer eating away at the automotive industry. Because if you can't have a skilled and qualified workforce, then those bays sit empty. And at some point in time, this emerging tsunami of all the boomers who are retiring and the shifting of the technology away from the wrenches to the diagnostics and the computers, it is moving so fast that you better be training this new pipeline of technicians. Or at some point in time, I don't wanna be waiting three weeks to get my car fixed so I can get to work or get to school. So I do think that this is a cause that matters. And I don't know that this industry, meaning automotive or diesel, they've never really thought of this as a cause. So it's easy to think about the health and kids and puppies as your cause, but this is a cause caring about technical education, caring about the skills gap, caring about uh, career exploration, um, jobs, 
these are all causes that matter. And I think that's something that Tech Force is working every single day to help both individuals as well as companies be able to get behind this, um, this message, message. So let's see. Well, uh, Lindsay, you got some questions kind I of? I do, well, I do. And actually the first one, I'm, selfishly, I'm gonna ask the first one. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's interesting that you talked about, you can get the kids interested, but it's, it's really the parents. You kind of have to shift, you know, the thinking a little bit. Um, and that's one thing, you know, our, what we serve at the Hilton Head Island Concours is, is similar to what you all are doing at Tech Force. We have a, a charitable fund that we call Driving Young America. And we partner with Castrol and Michelin on a physical presence at our event to showcase career opportunities and scholarship opportunities in the industry for students. And it was interesting talking with them in our planning this year before we canceled the event, the, the point came up that it's great. You can get the students in there all day long, but you've got to get the students in there with their parents. And that's the interesting thing. So my question is to you is how are you all, how does Tech Force get to the parents? What's your messaging and how do you communicate with them? Yeah, well, so great question. A lot of it's through video because a lot of this younger generation, now their parents are actually millennials. Uh, so whether you have to look at, you know, how does Gen Xers and how do millennials want to be communicated with? And so a lot of this is through video storytelling. A lot of it is through digital um, and ad buys. I mean, literally, I think about, you know, my sweet spot in marketing is the frustrated parent who wants to help their kid. Mm -hmm. That's a sweet spot, right? It's not the parent who's like, heck no, never. It's more of a, I didn't realize I, I didn't, you know, I just want my kid to be happy. And when you look at all the research on, especially female consumers, right? The number one goal is to raise great kids. That's number one goal in life. Um, if they have kids. And so to us, we look at it and say, where are those frustrated parents who know school might not be working for their kid? And, or, you know, they've got a dyslexia or ADHD or they're tinkering or they're going to these NASCAR races and reach out. So I always joke, it's like, you know, Google by ad, ad words, um, my kid hates school. <laughs> But it's also through partnerships, because as a good nonprofit, you'll never have a money to be able to make buy your way to success. Mm -hmm. We'll never raise enough money to just buy ads or to, you know, be everywhere. But through collaboration, I found in my 30 years, collaboration, unfortunately, is sometimes the last thing people think of. And when you're mm -hmm. a poor nonprofit and you never have any money, you get really grassroots. And, you know, grassroots and guerrilla marketing is really effective. So that's that's why we collaborate. So we collaborate with a Boy Scout, a Girl Scout, the Boys and Girls Club. I know I can do more when the school bell rings in reaching kids, millions of kids across America through collaborations. I know that borrowing the marketing muscle of my corporate partners who talk to millions of consumers, trying to get people to do a cause marketing campaign that if let's just pretend my dream, right? You walk into mm -hmm. an auto zone and there's an end cap that says, you know, um, do you know a kid like this? Uh, we're here to champion kids and technical education and that there's more than one road to success. I believe that a lot of consumer parents are going to be like, oh my God, I, I didn't know. So again, by collaborating with places where parents and the students live and work, uh, you can actually get a lot more messaging out to them. And then of course, it's all marketing, which is having this community where then people can sign up and through that gamification, mm -hmm. they keep coming back. And this is something where I think we, again, we built it so that a parent can get their kid involved in a tech force community, even at middle school or high school. And suddenly they start to see the kids doing the trivia, the kids posting their contests and games, uh, you know, uh, projects that they're working on the kids now getting a scholarship or tickets to a NASCAR race. Those are the carrots, frankly, that make a parent go, thank God, somebody's helping me. And again, a for-profit couldn't do it because a for-profit's going to have a dog in the fight or at least a perceived that way. Whereas a not-for-profit, we truly are here for just the best interests of the student, of that worker. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Well, um, you mentioned both, you mentioned two organizations I was actually going to ask about. Um, you mentioned the Boys and Girls Club and Boy Scouts and also, you know, spinoff of that, the Girl Scouts. And I know that there's somebody else 
on here that mentioned they also work with the Boy Scouts. Do you all have specific programs that you do with those organizations to catch the kids younger? Yeah, so again, these are the things that we keep working to line up. Uh, I have not, I did not end up signing with the Boy Scouts of America. I spent a lot of time talking. They've mm -hmm. had some challenges recently and a lot of staff turnover. So we didn't get that done. But again, with the Boys and uh, Girls Clubs, YMCAs, that is where we are working with those programs and connecting them to our school partners. So it's Tech Force's job to know every single technical high school in America, as well as post-secondary. And with our database being able to connect the dots to say, okay, here is a technical school, here is a boys and girls club in that community, um, here are volunteers willing to go in and public speak or what have you. Those are the types of programs we're, we're setting up through the tech force community to walk the talk locally. So we have lots of partnerships. One of the biggest and perhaps most successful is Skills USA. Skills USA has 40,000 students in their after school mm -hmm. programs around auto and diesel technology. Well, think about 57,000 kids graduating from tech school. What happened to those 40,000 in high school? Where did they go? So you can, again, get kids excited for a moment, but if you don't stay with them through that journey, they drop off and they get lost. Now, if they drop off because they choose otherwise, that's fine. But if they drop off because they don't know any better, then shame on us. So we've been working more and more closely with Skills USA to say, again, can you help train instead of 40,000 students, 80,000? They're like, yeah. And I said, then that's Tech Force's job to help promote. Same thing as these scouts, they've got, you know, an automotive badge. Why are we not in there with our employers and folks helping to make those auto badge experiences incredible? That is the kind of partnerships we've been building and starting to put into practice in communities um, around the country. Wonderful. I, um, I also wanted to ask, you know, if you've got someone, if we've got someone within our community that is interested in being a mentor, how would they get involved in a program with you all? Yeah, so great question. In, in this world, in my pre-life, it was harder because people would call us individually and you're trying to track and you're trying to deploy mm -hmm. without systems. So I would still say if you're a passionista, which again, I recognize lots of faces on this phone who have been doing just that saying, hey, I'm here to help anything I can do. And we do our best to connect those dots, but we are gonna be blessed in the new year with a, you know, a multi-million dollar technology build of being able to use IT to help start connecting those dots. Um, so I'm excited about that. So raise your hand anytime, but also, you know, I would ask for your help that come the new year, I'm going to want to, anybody here who's listening says, hey, I can help connect these, or we've got access to other people who would help. And I'd say in the new year, let's rock and see what we can really do with this, um, this new community. So will you all send out a notice um, if people want to find out when that's available, when that new system yeah. is available, do they sign up for your newsletter and that's the best way? Or, or Yeah, I would say the best thing to do media. right now is to go to techforce.org and you can subscribe to our newsletter. It's a once a month e-news called Under the Hood. Wonderful. Okay, well, I'm going to actually, I'm going to open this up to a few people who have asked questions. Um, Michael Dyronfirth, I'm going to put you on the spot. If I'm going to unmute you and let you ask your question directly. Hi, Jennifer. Thank you for coming. And you've identified a critical need. I'm a rapidly aging, retired vocational technical career and technical professor at four-year colleges and the like. I'm wondering what kind of connections you might have with the American Society for Engineering Education, with SEMA, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, well, the first one, none. So I would love introductions. What I have found in this industry is there's more acronyms than I could ever cook a bowl of soup. I mean, it is, you know, intense. Uh, so we're always looking to build these strategic alliances with these industry associations. And I would say we've just scratched the surface. We probably have about 20 um, partners and that could be ASE, ASA, um, NACAT, uh, all of those different you know, organizations that are listed on our website, but literally there's probably thousands more out there. Um, what we ask for is to just 
write a letter of cooperation saying, hey, we want to work with you and partner, and we're willing to lend our marketing muscle and our channels so that if TechForce has something to say or offer, that those partners are willing to put it out in their yeah. newsletters. So again, you're bar borrowing that, that distribution and marketing muscle to share messages. Or if we have an opportunity for people to volunteer, they can be like, yes, we would love to do that. Nope, we're busy next month. So I think those alliances are important. And so any introductions, but I formalize them because it's one thing to say we want to help, but if you actually don't formalize that type of partnership, then there's not an exchange of money, but the exchange of synergy. And when you write those letters and you sign them and you commit and you share logos and I put an account manager on that relationship, now I know it's going to be fed vice versa, and that we're going to pay attention and to leverage that. When you just kind of say one off, like, yeah, we want to work together. We'll get back to you or we'll talk throughout the year. I think it falls apart. Yep. So again, I mean, I think about, you know, ASC and all the tens of thousands of technicians that they work with on a daily basis on getting their certifications. You look at Skills USA. We have worked collaboratively with SEMA and attend SEMA, I love their youth education programs, et cetera. They've not signed a letter of cooperation with us. So only SEMA and NADA are the only two who have ever said we're passing, but everybody else, for the most part, the minute we can get the introduction, share the synergies of what we're doing, we're off to the races. So I welcome more. Good, I'll follow up and drop you uh, a letter through Lindsay. Okay, thank you. All right, I think um, our next question is coming from none other than Lynn St. James, who was actually our first featured host of our um, Women Driving America series. So Lynn, I'm gonna turn it over to you for your question. Be nice, Lynn, go easy on hey. me. <laughs> well, no, I am not gonna actually, I'm not gonna be easy on you, but you did a you did great to see you, your passion and your ability to be able to communicate so clearly um, the need and, and what tech for but, you know, I, in my years of, well, I'm going to say not-for-profits foundation, I mean, to me, not-for-profit or for-profit is really a very fine line. Um, the leadership is the most critical. To get to the highest level of any supporting organization is where you're going to really, realize you're crawling your way from the bottom to the top. And I'm just curious, what? What industry representatives, I mean, which ones are the most message where you feel like you are getting traction? Because they, you know, that's where they, the benefit that the whole story you're telling about the benefit they get from it. If they're just sort of, sort of, you know, check a box and then not really giving you the support you need to make and have the traction. I'm just curious what OEM, if you'll call anybody out as a real positive OEM or industry leader that um, that is really supportive, that really gets what you're talking about and, and the support to give you the traction that you need? Well, great question. I think um, there's been a shift as the pendulum has swung with the OEs. It used to be that the OEs, the manufacturers would say, don't come to us. We you know, don't hire technicians, so it's not our problem, call the dealerships. And then you'd go to the dealerships and they'd say, oh, we're so poor. You know, the OE, the manufacturers, they have all the money, go call the big brand. And you would get stuck into that cross. And there's still a lot of that. However, I think because again, the shortage has gotten so crippling that the OEs have had to start listening because the dealerships are just howling loud and saying, you know, we cannot solve this problem on our own. And so I, we are very much watching organizations and some of the leaders with us right now, Ford Motor Company, General Motors, uh, Nissan North America with Infinity and Toyota USA Foundation have put substantial resources into backing us and then connecting us with the dealer networks because these dealers are gonna make their own decision about whether they wanna participate in the tech force community or go to a local tech school and do anything with these kids or if they're just going to you know stand by and just try to hire them at the end of the funnel so those uh, organizations in particular have been really really cooperative and we're excited to have more i would say also the other thing is on the trucking side of the house we have a great relationship with uh, the american trucking association and their tmc division 
and uh, Daimler North America, and we're talking to some others as well right now who, again, recognize the shortage. And diesel is a whole nother animal, and uh, their, uh, their shortage is just as real. Uh, their pay is perhaps even higher. So a lot of young people are looking at diesel and saying, wow, you know, the pay that you can make in diesel is pretty good. So you're starting to see them step up more and more. I've been disappointed with motorcycle, uh, where literally uh, I have not been able to shake that loose at all. And yet, you know, again, they've got shortage. And we just opened it up in 2019 in the fall to start welcoming aviation. So I think aviation will be, again, maybe once we get past COVID, but going back into the real world, uh, aviation is going to be another bright spot uh, for the technician recruitment. Does that help, Lynn? Well, yeah, but I'm going to hang in for another two-parter, make the two-parter. Is automotive continue? I mean, I, I subscribe to automotive news. I've been working with auto, automotive news as a judge in their PACE Innovation Awards. But I just feel automotive news, I'm just sharing this with you, Reb, as I'll do it publicly and sending you an email because you're overwhelmed with everything, is I think automotive news could be a powerful collaborator to, to get the message out. And I mean, they're not gonna put money in the, it could help put pressure, I think, on the OEs, um, even the dealers uh, to communicate, as a communicator. You know, even if, it, I don't know, I just feel automotive news is a link, you know, to that could really help you. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And I'm, I would, I would love the intros. And, and yeah. just as I talked about those association partners, you know, we have the framework for media partnerships. And again, this is where I barely scratched the surface. So whether it's a, um, the uh, Babcock media and, you know, Ratchet and Wrench and those types of publications, to your point, automotive news, um, all throughout anybody who has a voice piece, we want, it's not about the exchange of money, it's about the exchange of the communication tool in the vehicle, whether it's a public service ad, a print ad, a column, a guest column, you know, we can provide content all day long and they have the eyes and balls that we need. I also say though, I always watch myself and say, don't just keep preaching to the choir, right? Which is the minute we can start to do a deal with Good Housekeeping and Parenting Magazine or other things like that where the parents are, which was a question before, right? That's a good then, then the more the parents and they, they start to get traction. And then the employers will be like, what is that? And why aren't we part? So again, I think there's a push and a pull to start to be able to say, hey, look, we have a Nissan and Ford and GM. Where are you? Why isn't your company part of this? And we have AutoZone and Advance. There's no exclusivity here. This is all about, you know, the workforce. So then you start to do that. And you're like, why isn't Napa here? So if everybody literally in this massive industry, I call it the McDonald's hamburger theory. If everybody threw in a buck, we'd have a billion bucks to solve this problem. But you know, again, they hold on like, eh, I don't know if I wanna you know, do anything. So it's all about rallying. So association partners, those nonprofit, you know, the after school programs, everything that I can do, we do what we can to try to convince counselors to stop naysaying it. But we also look for those media partners because once the parents start rising up saying, you know what, this is a plausible career path for my kid. And what company doesn't want to talk to a 16 year old kid who's about to buy their first car? You know, it's interesting that you bring up the, the aviation side because, you know, we, we learned in talking with our um, partners at Gulfstream, they're a sponsor of ours. Um, they're located, you know, headquartered in Savannah, Georgia, nearby us on Hilton Head. But it, it goes beyond just the, the tech side because they're also, they're finding a shortage in the upholstery side, the you know, custom cabinet side. So, I mean, they're working to engage young people in those activities as well. So that could be an interesting connect down the road too. I mean, who Absolutely. would go Gulfstream? I mean, that well, exactly. And then, you know, you of course have the restoration side of the house and you have some right. of the for foremost experts on the phone here from a Ray, Renee Chris, who I see mm -hmm. up at America's Automotive Trust. I see Diane Fitzgerald. I see Tabitha Haggerty. I mean, the, you know, these folks understand the artisans and the craftsmen that are, you know, viable and, and just so important to the whole restoration side of the house. So whether you're talking about Gulfstream and like you said, even the upholstery and all that, or you're even looking at our collectibles, mm -hmm. you know, there's just, um, it's a massive industry 
And it's, you know, I just say, if I can wake up every day and hope that a couple of kids who are wired for this and who would just thrive in this career path get to find their way, then success. Right, right. Well, let me, let me ask just a couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, can you, one of the things I noticed on your website is the shop makeover feature. How, mm -hmm. how does that work? How do people get involved to help make over a local, you know, school shop class? Yeah, this is a massive problem. Again, it's uh, the gentleman who just spoke before about CTE, career and technical education. And again, I've worked with YMCAs, et cetera. And a long time ago, I learned I can do more when the school bell rings in the out of school programs than trying to deal with every school district in the country. However, in the end of the day, uh, there are auto shop programs or diesel or collision in high schools. The few that are left out there, they're still hanging on by a thread, but they are there. And the pendulum swinging where you're starting to see more magnet and more types of, you know, these schools starting to come back up again. It's our job to invest in them. If we care about this industry, if we care about this cause, then having these students have access to state-of-the-art equipment and technology and training and exposure, even in the high school level, to start wetting that appetite to get them through the pipeline, we have got to stand strong for that. If we sit back and let try and just let the Department of Ed fund it, it ain't gonna happen. So the average high school auto shop program gets, let's just say the exact same amount of money as the marketing class gets, but their costs are dramatically different. And so to have those quality training tools and experiences, it costs money. And they're just not gonna get it through the school districts. So we looked at it and said at Tech Force, okay, there's the uh, Collision Repair Education Foundation, CREF, and they actually do a really good shop makeover program for high school collision repair shops where they get those training aids or makeovers, et cetera, in, but nobody was doing it for the automotive. And when you go into a lot of high school auto shop programs, it's like it's stuck in the back of the campus in a dark and dingy hole. And, and we're like, what? Why is it that the culinary department has all the shiny lights and stainless steel appliances and everything looks great, but you know, you go over to the auto shop and it's dingy and dark. What message are you sending the young people about the importance of this career path? So that is where we went and started saying people have training aids, leftover lifts. They, they have things they can donate but they don't A, know how, B, they don't have the time and C, they can't get it there. So we do that for them. If the company has stuff they can donate or equipment or training aids, we, along with one of our sponsors, FedEx Freight has offered, they will ship that lift or that equipment to any school that Tech Force is able to put that grant to, to get it where it needs to go. So you just have to raise your hand, call Tech Force and say, hey, we've got these, um, this equipment, these tools, these things could, can go to a, a auto shop, a high school or a auto shop program, and we'll find the school that can use it and we'll get it there. So that's your shop makeover. Wonderful. And I, we just had, we had one more question just pop in um, from Mary. She said, when I first went to grad school, I took a job detailing boats. Are pleasure boats another area crying for techs? Yes, Marine is uh, right in there. So again, let's see if I can get it right. Auto, aviation, <laughs> collision, diesel, motorcycle, Marine, motorsports, you know, so it's again, all the race cars, you think about the pit crews, et cetera. Those are all techs and just even down to welding. Um, all of these are uh, education, technical career paths that we support. Well, Jennifer, I want to I want to thank you so much for taking the time today to be here with us. Um, you know, we're kind of closing in um, on our hour here, so I just want to thank you for your time. I know you're you're quite busy. You've got your hands full with a big mission, so thank you. And we look forward to hopefully you know a continued relationship with you all and potentially maybe a partnership down the road. But um, very exciting about what you guys are doing, and just a big thank you for your time and joining us today.